let z be a complex number which has polar coordinates r and theta. That means that r is the modulus of z and is greater than or equal to zero, and theta is the argument of z, and is usually taken to be the principal argument between negative pi and pi, inclusive of pi. I'm going to assume immediately that you know, given these coordinates, that z could be written as r cos theta plus j r sine theta, where j squared is negative 1. Some people call that unit i instead. We're using j here. In Cartesian coordinates, r cos theta is just x and r sine theta is y. So this is just writing z equals x plus j y using the polar version of the coordinates. I'm going to assume also that you know that cos plus j sine of an angle theta is often written as cis theta. So if we pull r out as a factor, we can write z equals r cis theta. Once we've learned about the polar form for a complex number written in terms of cis of the angle theta, we normally go on to discuss multiplication and division of complex numbers in this form. And we very quickly learn that multiplying two cis functions results in adding the two arguments. There is also an equivalent result for division, which results in subtracting one argument from the other. I should now like you to ask yourself, where have you seen properties like that before, where multiplying two functions results in adding the arguments in the function, and dividing results in subtracting the arguments? I hope you've immediately thought of powers. In particular, let's talk about powers of an exponential, e to the power x and e to the power y. In fact, from the point of view of multiplication and division, exponential functions have precisely those same properties that are possessed by the cis function, namely that if you multiply two exponentials, you add the arguments, and if you divide the exponentials, you subtract. In mathematics, we have come to learn that when a function possesses a property of this kind, it is very often a unique function with that property, the only function. So that suggests that if we have another function with that property, here the cis, it might actually just be another version of the exponential. I'm now going to show you that that is indeed the case. I'm going to do it by comparing the Taylor series for the exponential and the cos and the sine. I want to start by writing out the Taylor series for the exponential function e to the power x. N not all of it, of course, because it's an infinite series, but here are the first six terms. Do you remember what that exclamation mark means? It's the factorial of the number concerned. So, for example, 4 factorial means 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and so on. I called this a Taylor series, but of course it's the Taylor series close to x equals 0, so I should really have called it a Maclaurin series. I'm now also going to write out the Maclaurin series for cos x and for sin x. In both cases, I've written the first three terms, though I think you could see how to extrapolate further. The rule is fairly obvious. Now I'd like you to stare for a moment at the cos and the sine and compare those series with the series for the exponential. Can you see that, for instance, the cos has some terms in common with the exponential? But in fact, only the even powers, the 1, which is x to the naught, and x squared and the x to the fourth, with the right coefficients, except that sometimes the sine is different. In exactly the same way, the terms in the sine series correspond with the even, so with the odd powers of e to the x, but again, sometimes with a sine difference. We're going to exploit that correspondence. Let's start by looking at the cos and the even powers. The 1's already match. The x squared over 2 factorial would match if it wasn't for the sine. But then when we get to the fourth power, it does match again. Can we think of something which, when you square it, gives a minus sign, but when you take a fourth power, gives back a plus sign? How about that imaginary unit j? j squared is negative 1 and j to the fourth is again plus one, and if we went on taking even powers, we would keep alternating, 
j to the sixth is negative one, and so on. So now think about it. Supposing in that exponential that we didn't have x, but jx. In that case, when we get to the squared term, instead of x squared, we would have jx all squared. And the j would square to minus one. That would make exactly the right sign to match against the cos. That's very promising. Let's write out that now the Maclaurin series for e to the jx. It would look like this. Of course, what kind of number e to the jx is, is a bit baffling. But let's just stick with this and see where it gets us. I'm now going to go through this th series and substitute that j squared is negative 1, j to the fourth is positive 1, and incidentally j cubed is negative j. Let's do that now. There, it looks like this. I've included the fifth power term as well. But now what we've got in this series is clearly a complex number, and it's got a real part and an imaginary part which is the coefficient of j. Let's break it up that way. OK, there we are. So now look at the blue series on the bottom line and compare it with the two red ones for cos and sine that are above. Look at the real part. 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, etc. That is exactly cos x. Furthermore, the coefficient of the j is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on. And that is exactly sine x. So what we've got here for e to the jx is equivalently cos x plus j sine x. But of course cos x plus j sine x is just the same as cis x. So in one sense, amazingly, but in another sense, not really surprisingly, we've discovered that cis x and this exponential of jx are the same function. So that is why when we multiply two cis functions we have to add the arguments, or if we divide them we subtract the arguments. It's because they're really exponentials in disguise. They are of course rather special exponentials with the imaginary unit in the argument. That's a remarkable discovery. We exploit this correspondence by writing the polar form for z now as z equals r cis theta, which we can now also write as r e to the j theta. This is a really convenient way to represent a complex number, and it often simplifies our calculations. It's actually also much more profound than it looks, because it relates the exponential to geometric concepts involving angle and rotation. In fact, this is the very beginnings of a topic known to mathematics, mathematicians as Lie group theory. Lie group theory is all pervasive in theoretical physics in our understanding of symmetries between particles. I'm not going to go there though. What I want to do though now is to finish by showing you some remarkable results for cos and sine. Let's go back to our cos plus j sine form for the cis. So in other words the black equation just above here that says cos plus j sine which is cis is equal to e to the jx. Let's write that out again. That relation is actually not an equation but an identity. It's true for any x we may wish to put in. So for example if we wanted to put in cos of negative x that would be permissible as long as we do it everywhere. However for this second equation we can simplify the trig side because cos is an even function so cos of negative x is the same as cos x. Furthermore sine is an odd function, so sine of negative x is minus sine of x. It's this bottom version of the equation I want to work with, so I'm going to delete the one in the middle. I've also numbered the two equations. Next I'm going to add equations 1 and 2. Let's see what happens. I hope you can see that we get two of the cos terms, but the j sine terms cancel each other. On the right we get the sum of the two exponentials. If we divide through by 2 we now have an imaginary exponential form for the cos of an angle. But of course cos of an angle is a real thing. It's something we can actually measure. So that is telling us that the right hand side here, despite being composed of imaginary exponentials, must actually turn out to be real in the end. This is a remarkable result for the cos. We can get an equivalent result for the sine. Instead 
we subtract equation 2 from equation 1. I'll leave you to do the algebra there. You end up having to divide not by 2, but by 2j. Then we get the following result. It's an expression for the sine in terms of the imaginary exponentials. This time, that difference in the brackets must itself be imaginary, because there's a j outside that needs to cancel to make the whole thing real. That's not a surprise, really, because after all, e to the negative jx is the complex conjugate of e to the jx. And when you take the difference of a number and its complex conjugate, you get a pure imaginary number. The results here for cos and sine are attributed to the Swiss mathematician Euler, and so they're called Euler's results, or sometimes Euler's angles. I'll write that name down, then I'm going to stop.